I may as well go ahead and get started. Um, so for Tuesday, you're doing the first exploratory reflection and you're reading chapter six and writing analytically. We're gonna be going back to the rhetoric textbook uh, for about a week while we get ready to work on the first big paper, right? Uh, so does anybody have any questions about anything? I need to write it down. Give you a minute to write things down, to think about it. Since this is a much smaller board and board space is thus at a premium. Mm -hmm. All good, everybody got this? All right. So if there are no questions about the homework, then let's just go ahead and start talking about uh, the Amy Tan piece. What did you guys think of this? How'd this go for you? What'd you get out of it? Okay. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, okay, uh, yeah, explain. Okay, yeah, so, so one of the things she's talking about is some of the issues that come with being bilingual and bicultural, right? You know, the, being, you know, the, you know, the child of immigrants who speaks two languages at home, right? So uh, can you point us to that, uh, to the particular passage you're thinking about, Ron? The second full paragraph? Yeah. Okay, uh, can you read it for us? I do not believe that my parents spoke immigrants from mainland China are an exception to the modern free school. I only I have only to look at the number of Chinese engineers, students, students, minority racial of art MIT and mm -hmm. Certainly they have, they were not raised by passive mothers and fathers who said, It is up to you, my daughter. Masseuse. Okay, so what what's the issue that she's that she's talking about here? Like what is what is she trying to what is the idea that she's trying to push back against? The stereotypical way like what you're like how you would say like Asian parents want them to be like a surgeon or the top of uh -huh. their class. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of high what, expectations. Yeah, a lot, and a lot of what they're talking about here is stereotyping, right? Mm -hmm. And what is her primary concern about stereotyping? Like, what what particular type of stereotyping does she seem to be most worried about? Where is where, like where's the stereotyping that she's worried about coming from? The job force. Well, maybe in this paragraph she's talking about education, about jobs, right? But in a broader sense, in the whole piece, in the whole essay. And as she says, like Chinese people think, like Chinese people are nice since they don't have a word for yes or no. Yeah. So a lot of what, what this hinges on is language, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the concern here is language and stereotypes that are based on misunderstandings 
regarding language. So yeah, let's go to, if we look on page 159, um, she's talking about this New York Times article that is the source of much of her ire in the essay, right? Can I get somebody to start reading this for starting with, I thought about this misunderstanding again. Hello. Yeah, go ahead, Gia. I thought about this misunderstanding again of social context failing in translation. When a friend sent me an article from the New York Times Magazine, 24 April 1988, the article on changes in New York's Chinatown made passing reference to the inherent oblivion of the Chinese language. Chinese people are so discreet and modest, the article stated, there aren't even words for yes and no. That's not true, I thought, but although I can see why an outsider might think that, I continued reading. If one is Chinese, the article went on to say, one compromises, one doesn't hazard a loss of face by an over emphatic. emphatic response. Uh -huh. My throat seized. Why do people keep saying these things? As if we truly were those little dolls that sold in Chinatown tourist shops, heads bobbing up and down in compliant in complacent agreement to anything said. I worry about the effect of one-dimensional statements on the on the unwary and guileless uh -huh. when they read about this so-called vocabulary deficient. Do they also conclude that Chinese people evolved into a mild-mannered lot because the language only allowed them to hobble forth with mixed words? Okay, so uh, you, you can stop there, right? So I've pulled um, a few important key words out of uh, what, she's, uh, what she's saying here, right? So let's start with the overall argument here. Like, what is the argument the article's making that has pissed her off? so discreet and modest because of their language. Yeah, that not having words for yes and no, like not having specific words that mean yes and no, means that the, the whole culture thus is discreet and modest, right? Now what does it mean to be discreet and modest? Like, like modest, like, I feel like it's more like towards like what you wear and like, how you like present yourself like when you're modest you don't really like show skin a lot or you don't wear like revealing clothes and you don't like reveal a lot about yourself to people okay i think that's the it, yeah it's that second part of it with what you just said there that's more important for this context right mm -hmm. Uh, we do use the word modest to mean like somebody who like somebody who dresses modestly is somebody who dresses in ways that you know that don't emphasize their body right yeah. But yeah, to be modest in your personality and your dealings with other people means to also means to cover up, right? It means to be kind of self-effacing. Yeah. Good. What does it mean to be discreet? Like quiet. Yeah, quiet and private, right? Mm So what then does this suggest, so if not having a specific word for yes and no makes Chinese people discreet and modest, according to this New York Times writer's article, then what else is this writer saying, maybe without even realizing or understanding what they're saying, about, the, about Chinese people generally? Like, if they're quiet and private and they're self-effacing. Like they're compliant, like... They won't cause a they're buzz. Told. Yeah, do what they're told. Yeah, they're compliant and they're, you're also saying that they're compliant and passive, right? right? Yeah, good. Now, the other words I wanted to focus on in here, right? So uh, the, the last sentence of the first paragraph says, right, the article on changes in New York's Chinatown made passing reference to the inherent ambivalence of Chinese language. What does it mean if something is inherent? Think about other words that it sounds like. Impatient? Not, yeah, it's not, not impatient. Maybe inherit. Yeah. If you inherit 
say some characteristic from your parents, what does that mean? You gain it from them. Pardon? You gain it from them. Yeah, yeah, that you've got, you get, yeah, that you've got it from kind of like, like this kind of source beyond your control, right? So if you have like an inherited disability, right, or an, an yeah. inherited illness, right, it's part of you, but it's something um, that <clears throat> you don't have any control over, right? You, you didn't choose. Yeah. So if something is inherent, it means that it's something that's kind of automatically a part of. So the thing that this writer is saying, not Amy Tan, but the writer of the New York Times article, is built into Chinese language is ambivalence. Now what's ambivalence? I'm wanting to say like dumb. What's that? I'm wanting to say like the word dumb. Okay, what, why, why, does this, why does this word make you think dumb? Like, because I could just hear someone saying, like, she's oblivious, like, she's oblivious. Okay, you're, okay, you're thinking, like, oblivious. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, ambivalent actually means um, something closer to ambiguous, right? So, ambivalent kind of literally was kind of, like, moving back and forth between two points, right? So, ambivalence meaning is closer to ambiguous. So, they're saying that Chinese language is ambiguous and as a result Chinese people are discreet and modest, right? Now what this journalist is working off of is a theory of language called the Saper Wharf Hypothesis. Although they are uh, working on a kind of warped amateur's understanding of it. So what Saper Wharf states is that your experience of the world oh, I've seen this so many times. Pardon? Pardon? I saw this so many times in like six theology. Okay. So th so this is not completely unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. So what do you remember before I finish the definition, what do you remember about it? <laughs> Sarah remember. <laughs> It's like, I just saw like a lot of like sociologists like talking about it. It wasn't like this one thing. Okay. So he was like known throughout. Okay. So you, rem you remember the hypothesis, you remember the name of it, but you don't really remember the concept. Yeah. Okay. So the Safer Warp states your experience of the world is shaped by the language you use to describe the world. Right? Thus, culture and personality end up being shaped, to some sense, uh, by language. So, when you've got an outsider who doesn't fully understand the nuances of the language they're talking about and starts misapplying this theory, right? then they come to a number of incorrect conclusions about the people that they're discussing. Right? What does Tan, for example, tell us later on in the essay about Chinese for yes and no? Like, the way they say it is like, basically like a sentence rather than just a word. You know, yeah. Like, uh, I see it in my Uh -huh. If she, if he or she has eaten, and he or she might say like eaten already instead yeah. of saying yes or yeah. did not have. So yeah, so and, and, like kind of what she's saying here is that actually Chinese for yes and no is situational, right? Right. And is actually more specific because it de like the word you use depends on the question you've been asked, right? Yeah. Right. So you could say, oh, there's no word for yes or no. But really, our way of using yes and no is less specific, right? right? Ours is Our, they, yeah, ours is, is more ambivalent than they theirs. They don't really is, put right? thought into it. No, 
Yeah, it's just you know we, we you know, it, it, it doesn't yeah it doesn't require a response to the specific question, right? Yeah, yeah good. So <clears throat> one of the dichotomies that she's dealing with here is insider outsider, right? And how insider knowledge of a language and culture differs from the kinds of assumptions made by outsiders. And it is very, very difficult, I'm finding, to find points to write on on this uh, whiteboard that don't make the whole damn thing flip over. So, <laughs> so let's look at the examples she chooses to demonstrate insider versus outsider knowledge here. Can I get somebody to read for us uh, the little story she tells at the beginning? about her aunt, her aunt and uncle coming to visit from China and having dinner at the home. Page 159. I'll read it. Great, thank you. Um, at a recent family dinner in San Francisco, my mother whispered to me, Sal Sal, brother's wife, pretends too hard to be polite. Why bother? In the end, she always takes everything. My mother thinks like a, I don't know say that, an ex, yeah, just you, you can skip the word and just see yeah, an, an expatriate. An expatriate. Temporarily yep. away from China since 1949, no longer patient with ritual, with ritual courtesies. As if to prove her point, she reached across the table to offer my elderly aunt from Beijing the last scallop from the happy family seafood dish. Sal Sal scowled. I don't want it. I really, I don't, she cried, patting her, plat, her plump stomach. Take it, take it, scolded my mother in Chinese. Full, I'm already full, Sal Sal protested weakly, eyeing the beloved scallop. I, exclaimed my mother, completely exasperated. Nobody else wants it. If you don't take it, it will only rot. At this point, Sal Sal sighed, acting as if she were doing my mother a big favor by taking the wretched scrap off her hand. My mother turned to her brother, a high-ranking communist official who was visiting her in California for the first time. In America, a Chinese person could starve to death. If you say you don't want it, they won't ask you again forever. My uncle nodded and said he understood fully. Americans take things quickly because they have no time to be polite. Okay, so first thing I want to point to here, right? The uncle says he understands fully. Mm -hmm. Does he? Mm -mm. They don't understand each other at all, right? Why don't they understand each other? What's what's happened here? They believe in two different things. She's yeah. Been, she's been in America for so long, and, and he's, he's been a communist leader. Yeah, he's a communist. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, but you know, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, he's he stayed in. The basic difference here is that he stayed in China, yeah, and like, she didn't. Right. They just believe in different things, and then they'll do different things. Like they act on different things. Sure. But I think that, yeah, the, the more important difference being pointed out is probably less a political difference and more a, uh, a cultural divide, right? Mm -hmm. Geographical um, difference. Pardon? Like a geographical difference? Yeah, that, you know, the, that the, mother has, the mother here has become more Americanized, right? Mm -hmm. And is thus making certain assumptions about definitions of politeness, right? That her Chinese guests... Um, might disagree with, right? So, for example, when the mother complains about her sister-in-law's behavior, what does she accuse her sister-in-law of doing? Not being polite. Is she accusing her of not being polite? She's being too polite. Or too polite. Pretends to be polite, right? Yeah. The key word here is pretends. What does it mean if someone is pretending to like, do something or to be something? What are you accusing them of doing if you're saying they're pretending? Faking. Yeah, that they're fake, right? Yeah. That this is fake. She's not really polite, she's just pretending. Putting on a show, right? Mm -hmm. And then if we look at the brother's response, the, 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 the uncle's response at the end, right? Yeah. Does he regard this behavior as pretending to be polite? No, this is polite, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that because Americans take things quickly, they don't, 
have time to be polite, right? So what we're dealing with here are two different definitions of polite, right? They're divided by the way they would define this particular word. That for the brother and his wife, polite is a set of ritual courtesies, right? While for the mother, polite is kind of in a more American sense, not wasting people's time, right? Not making people offer you the same scallop over and over again before you take it. You know, whereas, you know, in China and certain other East Asian countries, right, traditionally, if someone offers you something, you're supposed to refuse it twice before you take it. It's part of a you know, kind of complex, um, you know, courtesy ritual, right? So, <clears throat> I want to compare this to the story that Tan tells at the end of the piece when she tells her uncle and her aunt that she wants to take them out to dinner. Can I get somebody to read that for us on page 165? Yeah, go ahead. Are you hungry? I asked in Chinese. Not hungry, said my uncle promptly. The same response he once gave me 10 minutes before he suffered a low, a low blood sugar attack. Not too hungry, said my aunt. Perhaps you're hungry? A little, I admitted. We can eat, we can eat. They both consented. What kind of food, I asked. Oh, it doesn't matter. Anything will do. Nothing fancy. Just some simple food is fine. Do you like Japanese food? We haven't had that yet, I suggested. They looked at each other. We can eat it said my uncle bravely, the survivor of the long march. We have eaten it before, added my aunt, raw fish. Oh, you don't like it? I said, don't be polite. We can go somewhere else. We are not being polite. We can eat it, my aunt is insisted. So I drove them to Japantown, and we walked past several restaurants featuring colorful plastic displays of sushi. Not this one. Not this one either, I continue to say as if searching for a Japanese restaurant similar to the last. Here it is, I finally said, turning into a restaurant famous for its Chinese fish dishes from Shandong. Mm -hmm. Oh, Chinese food, cried my aunt, obviously relieved. My uncle patted my arm. You think Chinese? It's your last night here in America, I said, so don't people lie. Act like an American. And that night we ate a banquet. So what's different in this interaction? I have, like, she kind of called him out a little bit, I guess. She yeah. was like, don't be polite or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like she knew that they didn't want Japanese food, so she yeah. just took them to a Chinese restaurant. Yeah. And they were relieved. Yeah, but she still pretends that they're looking for a Japanese restaurant, right? Yeah. And while, like, how do her, how do her aunt and uncle's responses sound to us? Like, you know, when her uncle says, you know, oh, it doesn't matter, nothing fancy, just simple food is fine, you know, and then she says, do you like Japanese food? He says, we can eat it. It's like saying, like, well, eat it like we don't want that. It's yeah. like a, it's like an, a, a traditional American husband and wife situation where one asks, <laughs> "What do you want to eat?" And the other one's like, "I don't care." Yeah. The says but then they do care, right? So yeah, like, like this is actually not something that is specific necessarily to one culture, right? Right. This kind of talking around the issue, yeah. But um, the basic point here, right, is that she understands exactly what they mean, right? She knows from their responses that they don't want this stuff. They don't want Japanese food. So she, but that they don't want to embarrass her, right? Yeah. By saying, no, we don't want that. The point here being is that she has correctly read the cultural codes, right? That her mother has been ignoring. Yeah. So, what they mean when they say these things is perfectly clear to her. But that's because she's describing herself as a cultural insider, right? And then an insider gets these nuances, while an outsider does not. And you know, there, there are things kind of beyond words, I think is a lot of what she's saying that, um, 
make up the way we respond to language. So I do want to go back to some of these other things that she said when she was talking specifically about that New York Times article. We go back to page 159. If one is Chinese, the article went on to say, one compromises, one doesn't hazard a loss of face by an over-emphatic response. My throat seized. Why do people keep saying these things? As if we truly were those little dolls sold in Chinatown tourist shops, heads bobbing up and down in complacent agreement to anything said. So let's focus for a second here on the, the simile here, right? What is she comparing Chinese people to the way that they are represented in that article? Bobbleheads. Yeah, the bobblehead dolls. <laughs> and how does this simile work? Let's pick this apart for a second. What does a bobblehead ball what does a bobblehead doll do? Bob just bobs his head up and down constantly, right? Mm -hmm. And that kind of motion, right, we associate with what? Nodding yes. Nodding yeah. yes, agreement, right? Yeah. So a bobblehead doll is a doll that constantly agrees with you, right? Mm -hmm. I actually find bobblehead dolls extremely creepy. Yeah. <laughs> right? Anything with big heads and little bodies, right? You know, like bobblehead dolls, toddlers, right? These things terrify Toddlers. <laughs> Yeah, and a bobblehead doll can't do anything but agree, right? The way it's constructed, you can't make it, like, if you want to make it shake its head, no, you have to actually put your hands on it and turn it, right? Mm -hmm. Because its brain doesn't, like, it can't physically do that. Yeah. And what is, yeah, and yeah, and essentially what causes the bobblehead doll's motion? It's brain. Pardon? It's brain tapping it. Yeah, the spring inside allows it to move, right? And then it just operates by you know, using gravity, right? So it's always acted upon, never acting, right? So not only are bobblehead dolls only capable of agreeing, only capable of saying yes, they're also um, a good kind of metaphor for passivity, right? Now why else might a doll be an appropriate metaphor here? Because they're like pristine. Okay, what do, you, uh, what do you mean by that? Like dolls are meant to be like perfect and pretty. Okay. So they're kind of like the ideal, I don't know, ideal thing. Although are bobblehead dolls usually pretty? No. Yeah, bobblehead That's dolls are actually kind of more like a little grotesque and sometimes comical looking, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, 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 they're funny looking. And what is it, like, what's the purpose of a doll? Like, like, yeah, teams and stuff like that. It's just, I'm sorry, what were you saying, Elizabeth? Like, like you can quicker. buy them for like basketball teams, football teams. Just. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, you often, like, yeah, buy like a mascot or a favorite player, right? Yeah, but yeah, but they're, they're toys, right? You're supposed to play with them, right? Yeah. So, not only does she see this article as comparing um, Chinese people to this inanimate object, right? But you know, to an inanimate object that is a kind of funny looking toy for people to play with, right? A toy that's never gonna tell you you're wrong, that's always going to agree with you. Now this gets into the language she uses in the following paragraph, right? I worry about the effect of one dimensional statements on the unwary and guileless. When they read about this so-called vocabulary deficit, do they also include that, do they conclude that Chinese people evolved into a mild-mannered lot because the language only allowed them to hobble forth with minced words? What's a deficit? 
If you have a deficit, what does that mean? If I say, for example, there's a deficit in your vocabulary, what am I saying? Like they're lacking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A deficit is a lack, right? If I'm saying you have a deficit in your vocabulary, I'm saying you don't know enough words, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so a deficit is a lack. And what does it mean to hobble? Limp, I guess. Yeah, it's limping, right? So if you hobble, right, there's something that prevents you from walking straight on your own, right? Include Chinese people evolved into a mild mannered lot because the language only allowed them to hobble forth with minced words, or words that have been chopped up, cut short. And I think like one of the, the things like with again with hobbling and mincing, right, is we're talking about things that are largely done to you, right? rather than things that you have done yourself, or the result of your action, right? So the idea that she is complaining about these people who apply the saper wharf hypothesis um, inaccurately to Chinese, right, is that they are suggesting that Chinese language is like a disability, right? that this particular form of expression leaves you unable to do certain things. And it's clear that, <clears throat> right, she disagrees. Um, and let's look at, you know, another example that she pulls out of this. Um, where is this? Um, it's uh, back on page 164 again. It makes me wonder, though. How many anthropologists, how many sociologists, how many travel journalists have documented so-called natural interactions in foreign lands, all observed with spiral notebook in hand? How many other cases are there of the long lost primitive tribe, people who turned out to be sophisticated enough to put on the Stone Age show that ethnologists had come to see? And how many tourists fresh off the bus have wandered into Chinatown expecting the self-effacing shopkeeper to admit under duress that the goods are not worth the price asked. I have witnessed it. I don't know, the tourist said to the shopkeeper, a Cantonese woman in her 50s. It doesn't look genuine to me. I'll give you $3. You don't like my price, go somewhere else, said the shopkeeper. You are not a nice person, cried the shop tourist. Not a nice person at all. Who say have to be nice, snapped the shopkeeper. So. This example of the shopkeeper is meant to demonstrate what here? What is the shopkeeper doing in this interaction with the tourist? Defending herself. Yeah, she's just defending herself, asserting her rights, right? Mm -hmm. She's saying, like, look, you don't like the price I'm charging for this, you go somewhere else. Right? I don't care what you think of it. But how has that defied the tourist's expectation? What do the tourists seem to expect her to do? Be compliant. Yeah, that she'd just roll over, right? And when she doesn't just roll over, when she talks back, what's the tourist's response? Shock. Yeah, and not just shock, right? He specifically tells her, right, you are not nice. This surprise 
at her lack of compliance, right, leads the Taurus to make some sort of conclusion about this person's personality because of what this outsider expects the culture to be like, right? Yeah. Now, I think it's also important to compare these two episodes to each other here, right? The Taurus. And then what's what's she talking about in the paragraph before the Taurus? What kind of people? Anthropologists, sociologists, journalists. Yeah. Versus these various educated professionals, right? And how are both of these groups alike for her? How are these educated professionals, these scientists and journalists, anthropologists, similar to the tourist in the second example? Because they only can observe a culture they can't really, they can't really justify their statements or how they feel about a culture because they're not a part of it. Yeah, they're both outside. Both sets are outsiders, right? Good. And then what does their outsiderdom lead them to believe? About Chinese people? Pardon? About Chinese people? Yeah. That they're nice and won't cause a reference about anything. Yeah. So essentially, yeah, what, what she's demonstrating is that both of these groups, however educated they are supposedly about the culture, that both these groups of outsiders are naive, right? They both show up with wrong-headed assumptions about the people they're dealing with and thus can be easily fooled, right? or easily led to believe something incorrect, right? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> the last part of this that I really want to, uh, to look, I have no idea where we are for time. Um, I suspect we're running a little bit. Flower six. Okay, so yeah, so we're running, we're running a little bit ahead of where we usually do. Um, I want to look at, Kind of the middle of the essay, pages 162 and 163 here. Can I get somebody to start reading um, page 162 uh, near the bottom of the page? It says, Saper was right about differences between two languages and the realities. I'll read it. Yeah, go ahead. Saper, Saper was right about differences between two languages and the realities. I can illustrate why word-for-word -word translation is not enough to translate meaning and intent. I once received a letter from China which I read to non-Chinese speaking friends. The letter originally written in Chinese had been translated by my brother-in-law in Beijing. One portion described the time when my uncle at age 10 discovered his widowed mother, my grandmother, had remarried. As a number three concubine, the ultimate disgrace for an honorable family. The translated version of my uncle's letter read in part. In 1925, I met my mother in Shanghai. When she came to me, I didn't have I didn't have greeting to her as if seeing nothing. She pulled me to a corner secretly and asked me why I didn't have greeting to her. I couldn't control myself and cried, Mom, why'd you leave us? People told me one day you ate a bean cake yourself. Your sister-in-law found it and swore at you, called your, called your name. So, is it true? She clasped my hand and answered immediately. It's not true. Don't say what like this. After this time, there is a few chance to meet her. Keep going. Yeah, keep going. What, cried my friends, was eating a bean cake so terrible? Of course not. The bean cake was simply a euphemism. A 10-year-old boy did not dare, ask, dare question his mother on something as shocking as con concubinage. Eating a bean cake was his equivalent for committing the selfish act, something inconsiderate of all fa family members, hence my grandmother's despairing response to what seemed like a ludicrous charge of gluttony. And sure enough, she was banished from the family, 
and my uncle saw her only a few times before her death. Okay, so does everybody understand, by the way, what a concubine is or what concubinage is? Mistress. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of like more official. It's kind of halfway between a mistress and a wife. But yeah, the, the point being is that like someone who comes from, um, like I guess what we would regard as a middle to upper middle class family in um, Chinese culture in the early 20th century, right? This would have been shameful to the family, right? To be, you know, the number three concubine of um, someone's husband, right? Not the number one, the number three. <laughs> <laughs> so, there are a couple of things, a couple of things to note here, right? So first off, what is the basic point here being made about word-for-word -word translations between languages? That they're different of what they're trying to say. Yeah, that word-for-word -word translation really doesn't work, right? There are a lot of phrases in this that seem stilted or confusing to us, right? Because there may not be a direct equivalent in English or because the, Chi the closest Chinese equivalent um, really kind of says something else, right? So like, for example, everybody understood, right, what have greeting to her meant, right? Yeah, I was saying hi to her. Yeah. Or like hugging her. Yeah, basically what this is that he didn't say hello, right? You know, when he says at the end here, there was a few chance to meet her, what does that mean? After this time, there was a few chance to meet her. He didn't, he didn't see her, her much after that? Yeah, now in English, if you have a few chances to meet somebody, that means you have multiple chances, right? Mm -hmm. So the emphasis is different here, right? Um, what this is saying is that he didn't, have, he didn't see her much after this. And then there's the issue here of the bean cake as well, right? Now, she explains what the bean cake means to her, right? She understands the euphemism. She understands the metaphor. Why don't her friends in America understand the metaphor? Because they took it, they take, they like took it literally. Yeah. Yeah, we have the literal versus figurative here, right? That, yeah, on the literal level, right, go, just going and eating a whole bean cake by yourself might seem a little selfish, right? Yeah. But doesn't seem so bad. Yeah. It's the figurative meaning that's important, and that doesn't really translate. Mm -hmm. Right? Figurative meanings are often not cross-cultural, right? How many of you, so Ron, um, I know that you were bilingual. Um, does anybody else speak another language? No. <laughs> okay, so the, the rest of us are pretty, do, do we remember, even like from our high school mm -hmm. language classes, nothing? <laughs> One to 10 is Spanish, that's what I went in knowing and that's what I came out knowing. Okay, like, so. I can probably read it, I can't write it. Okay. And I know John Day means what? Uh-huh. Donde means Donde? where. Okay, Donde means where. I know no means no. Okay. <laughs> and por favor means please. Okay, so Ron, I don't want to pick on you about this, and if you're not comfortable answering, it's it's, it's totally okay, right? But um, did you speak uh, both languages at home or only one language at home when you were growing up? Just one? Yeah. Um, just, just Spanish at home? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And when you were learning English, what was the hardest part of the language to learn? What was the hardest thing to grasp? Uh, the uh-huh. Okay, yeah, so you got like, like divided worlds, right? One experience is all in Spanish, one experience is all in English, right? Um, so you were learning English in school. So was there a specific point in your learning English in school 
where it was particularly difficult? Like, was there a particular concept in English language that was really hard to grasp? Okay, I'm going to go fall back on my own high school and college language learning experiences, right? I took German in high school and college, which we don't offer here, mm -hmm. because of course we don't. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> when I first started learning metaphors and idioms, right? When I first started learning figures of speech, this was the stuff that was really, really tough, right? because it was stuff that to me didn't make any sense, right? Like I didn't understand the, like the, the terms of comparison for German metaphors and things like that, right? Um, so these figures of speech just looked to me nonsensical. But then the same could be said of a German who is trying to learn English, right? Our metaphors look weird. So you, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Okay, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so the point she's trying to make here, right, is that insider levels of language or insider levels of understanding of a language are always going to be different from and superior to an outsider trying to understand the same language and that any assumptions anybody makes about culture based on language are often going to be coming from a pretty shaky foundation, right? That, you know, like, a, you know, an American approaching this just thinks that, wow, the Chinese really love their bean cakes, right? <laughs> but the bean cake's not the point, right? Mm -hmm. The bean cake is incidental. The bean cake is just a vehicle for the comparison, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so... She follows this up then with a story about her nephew in China with, uh, with whom she's, you know, she's writing letters back and forth with this nephew. I am evidently one of the outsiders. My nephew in Shanghai, who recently started taking English lessons, has been writing me letters in English. I had told him I was a fiction writer, and so in one letter he wrote, Congratulate to you on your writing. Perhaps one day I should like to read it. I took it in the same vein as perhaps one day we can get together for lunch. I sent back a cheery note. A month went by and another letter arrived from Shanghai. Last one perhaps I hadn't writing distinctly, he said. In the future, you'll send a copy of your works for me. Mm -hmm. So what she assumed was just a polite little pleasantry, right? No, he really wanted to read her books. <laughs> it's like, no, no, like, I'm serious here, send me the books, right? Yeah. So, what she's pointing up here is the problem of living in those kind of two linguistic worlds, right? Being an insider in both also means to some extent being an outsider in both, right? As American as she is, she still feels different from her American friends and often has to explain things to them, right? And even when she is dealing with or writing with, uh, you know, writing back and forth to Chinese family members, she also doesn't always catch all the nuances in their language either, right? So there's another theme emerging here of bilingualism. And biculturalism. as a kind of in-between or placeless state, right? You're always an insider and an outsider on both sides of that divide. So, you know, we could say that this particular essay seems to be about cultural misunderstandings brought about by linguistic difference, right? That's kind of like the surface level complaint here, right? The judgments people make about Chinese culture based solely on superficial understanding of language. But it seems like what she's really 
getting on about here is not shadow puppets, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you zone down. <laughs> but yeah, there's also like this kind of like, underneath the whole, the, the whole thing, there's this kind of substratum of this kind of discom like discomfort in both worlds, right? This sense of trying to fit in in both places and not really quite getting there, right? Okay, so does anybody have any questions about any of this? Anything to say? Any questions about assignments or anything? Okay, so I think we are a little early today. That's fine. It's a beautiful day. Go off and just do something to enjoy yourselves, right?